So, the next speaker in this session is myself. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make the rules. Nope. So this is a field study on how to share such sessions. And I will talk about uh, manipulation of interface induced skirmions studied with SDM. And I can benefit from the fact that skirmions were already a topic. Um, and skirmions have been introduced today, so I will just keep it very brief. And um, as you know, the jalushinsky moria interaction, or DMI, which is due to spin orbit coupling, actually um, is responsible for the canting between the spins and actually um, introduces the, these twists in the magnetic texture. And uh, this DMI can occur when the inversion symmetry is broken, which is in, for example, chiral crystal structures or at any surface or interface. And I will concentrate on this kind of um, interface-induced DMI. And then at such an interface, when you look at the spins, you have selection rules for the DMI. And in the end, you will favor a cycloidal or a nail-type um, twist of the um, spin texture. And all the interface-induced skirmions sort of look like these hedgehogs here. And for each material, they occur in a material-specific um, rotational sense. And um, these DMI systems, they are studied as sort of uniaxial spin textures, as in spin spirals or nail type domain walls with unique rotational sense, but also recently they are studied in, in skirmions or skirmionic bubbles or whatever you want to call them. Importantly, Due to the DM interaction, they have unique rotational sense, but they come in various sizes, as, you, as you've already seen today. And um, we are concentrating on these nanometer scale magnetic skirmions and model type systems. And um, the way to investigate such small magnetic textures um, is spin polarized STM, where basically we are um, exploiting the tunnel magnetoresistance effect in STM geometry. So if you have a planar tunnel barrier here, you know that um, the uh, magnetoresistance between two parallel magnetized electrodes is different from um, two electrodes with anti-parallel magnetization directions. And that is exactly what we do in an STM setup. We use a magnetic tip and now our tunnel current um, depends on the relative alignment of tip and sample magnetization. And this would be sort of the current that we draw over such a domain wall here. We are doing all our measurements in ultra high vacuum on model systems and at low temperature. And we can apply magnetic fields always perpendicular to the sample surface, as you will see. Um, so our basis is an interface which we know to have a large DMI. And this interface is um, the iron interface with iridium-111. And um, we know that in this iron monolayer, um, due to the DMI, we find skirmion lattices on the nanometer scale. And um, DFT has calculated that the DMI is very strong Thus, the skirmions are very small. Here is an, an image of such a skirmion lattice. So here, each skirmion is made up um, out of 12 atoms. And these structures are very beautiful, but they are sort of useless because we can't do anything with them. They don't change even if we apply nine Tesla. So they're just there at zero field and they they are unchanged. So we want to tune this iron iridium interface to um, play around with the spin textures and um, to ma manipulate the phases. Now, to tune um, this interface, we can add different overlayers. For example, if we put a monolayer of rhodium on top of the iron, we see that from this two-dimensional magnetic state, we go to a uniaxial magnetic state, a spin spiral, with a very similar magnetic length scale of one to one and a half nanometer. Also, this state doesn't change in external magnetic fields of nine Tesla. 
if we put a monolayer of nickel on top of this iron monolayer, we get these islands here. One is a little bit brighter, the other one is a little bit darker, and this nickel-iron bilayer just becomes ferromagnetic, which is also sort of boring. Now, today I would like to present um, two systems which are less boring. First of all, this is a monolayer of palladium on top of this iron iridium, which um, I will talk about first, and then later on I will um, show you what happens if we don't not only have one monolayer of iron, but you go to thicker iron layers on this iridium-111 surface. So this palladium iron um, is shown here, and these islands here, where you see the stripes, are a palladium monolayer on an iron monolayer on the iridium substrate. And wherever you have this palladium iron bilayer, you see these stripes, and they are indicative of such a spin spiral order. And this time, it's on a length scale of 6 to 7 nanometers. And here, when we apply external magnetic fields, for example, of one Tesla, we see that we still have some stripes, but we also get these dots. And then at a little bit larger magnetic fields, 1.4 Tesla, we se see only the dots. And we interpret these dots as such magnetic skirmions. So here we are in a skirmion lattice phase. And at even larger magnetic fields, the whole palladium iron is just fully saturated. And it's in a ferromagnetic state. So how do we actually know that these dots are magnetic skirmions? For this, we need to um, sort of image some key features of magnetic skirmions. And this is a sketch of what happens if, when we look at a magnetic skirmion with an out-of-plane magnetized tip. So we have parallel magnetization in the center of a skirmion. We have anti-parallel magnetization surrounding the skirmion. And in on the ring here, the tip and sample magnetization are orthogonal, so the magnetic contribution to the signal vanishes. And we get these, these round axisymmetric dots here in our SPSTM image. Now, if we use a tip that is magnetized in the surface plane, we're sensitive to different components of the sample magnetization. Namely, now we get the largest signal on the sides of the skirmion, where we have maximal parallel or maximal anti-parallel from tip and sample magnetization. So we get these, this two-lobe structure with this kind of tip magnetization. And now we see that all the skirmions that we image in our sample look identical. <coughs> they are always blue on the left and red on the right side of the skirmion. This means that they have unique rotational sense. They are all the same, thus they are driven by the DM interaction. If we invert the external magnetic field from into the plane to out, out of the plane and the tip magnetization is kept fixed, all the spins invert, and this two-lobe structure also changes contrast. And this is what we expect for um, unique rotational sense of the skirmions. And I think you had an introduction that these are um, topological objects because you can wrap the spins exactly once around the unit sphere. Now, what else can we do now that we have this very high resolution? We can study what the skirmion spin, tex spin texture actually looks like on an atomic scale. And this is what I want to present now. So we have these skirmions and we can take line profiles of our magnetic signal across the skirmion. And you arrive at these black circles here. And, um, Unfortunately, there's no analytical formula to characterize these skirmions, but a um, good idea seemed to be to just take a 360-degree um, domain wall, because that's exactly the angle that the spins do across a skirmion, and try to fit with a 360-degree wall formula, and the fit is actually this red line. So that seems to be a reasonable um, assumption to try to characterize the skirmion. And of course, from our um, data, we can immediately calculate 
the Z component of the magnetization, which is shown here, as it is expected for a skirmion. And this is actually um, the spin structure that we then derive experimentally. And here, each cone represents one atom. Now, um, we can, of course, do this for um, various magnetic field values. And as you can see, as we increase the external magnetic field, the skirmions get squeezed together due to the Zeeman energy. And we can characterize the skirmions here and evaluate the polar angle for the different magnetic field values and um, basically see that the not only the size of the skirmion changes in external magnetic field, but also the shape changes, as you can see here. And to give you a flavor, what that really means um, is Somehow, we're looking at all, all these, uh, at this skirmion, at this material, and basically the, the reason why this skirmion actually changes its size and shape like this must lie in the material parameters. So this is the energy functional for magnetic skirmions, and it's, um, it gives the, the exchange stiffness, the DMI value, the magnetic anisotropy and the magnetic field value. And now one can find material parameters A, D and K, which basically describe the system very well, just based on the experimental parameters. And we plug in a saturation magnetization that we get from DFT, and then determine A, D and K experimentally by looking at the experimental data and comparing it to the energy functional. And this is the values that we actually get. And if we um, plug these values into micromagnetic simulations, we get um, these images here. And you see that they agree nicely with the experimental data. So this is a way to actually determine the material parameters just from um, the experiments, if the spatial resolution is large enough to do that, actually. Mm. Now. This is, these are two images where each cone represents an atom. And this is the size of the skirmions that I've just presented at one Tesla and at two and a half Tesla. So here you see that really it's just a couple of dozen atoms that um, this skirmion um, is large. I have a question. Uh, can you determine the chirality? I mean, you're drawing nail skirmions, but in principle, if they were block skirmions, you would be seeing exactly the same images? Um, yes, in this setup, with just one perpendicular magnetic field, we cannot determine um, the chirality because we don't have control over our in-plane tip magnetization. But in another setup with in-plane magnetic fields, we can. So I'm, I, I'm not showing this data, but we have determined the, the chirality and also the nail character. And this is in agreement with DFT calculations for the system. Plus, due to symmetry reasons, if they were block skirmions, they would necessarily have to occur in both rotational senses. Because the, due to the block symmetry, the DMI would just be zero. And because they all have the same unique rotational sense, we know they have DMI, and thus they must be nail skirmions. This is a little bit, um, but we also have experimental data to show this. Um, and now I would like to come to a different system. It's still the iron iridium interface, but now we're not putting palladium on top anymore, but we're just putting more iron. And here you still see the iron monolayer and this nanoskirmian lattice. And here you see an island of iron double layer, but now the strain is too large. So the iron has a smaller lattice constant than the iridium, and it doesn't want to um, <coughs> grow hexagonal on the iridium 111 surface. So dislocation lines are incorporated to um, relieve some strain, and the dislocation lines run in this direction. And what you actually see here as this zigzag, this is the magnetic superstructure. 
Um, and we find three rotational domains on the surface because it's a hexagonal surface. And the, um, this zigzag is a spin spiral and it's just linked to the dislocation lines. So this is sort of a, a sketch of what you see here. You see these dislocation lines and this is the magnetic structure which strongly links to the dislocation lines, makes this zigzag structure and um, this is the structure model which we propose and from this you can actually see it, why it wants to make this zigzag if we assume that the um, propagation vector of a spin spiral would like to run the along this line of atoms, then it's exactly, um, it will be a zigzag configuration. Now, the length scale um, of this magnetic state is still on the nanometer scale, so it's one or two nanometer. We've shown that it's cycloidal. This is again due to the DMI, so of nail type, but again, we don't see a change up to nine Tesla. Um, so we cannot manipulate this state. Now, here is an image of what happens if we put more iron. Now, this is starting to get a little bit complicated because we see areas of different local height in this image. For example, here you have the double layer that you just saw, but on this scale you don't even see the magnetic state clearly. Then here you have a large region of third layer where you see a lot of stripes. And then these regions here, which don't show a clear pattern, are layers um, where the iron is four monolayer thick. So whereas the monolayer has this nanoskermian lattice and the double layer has a spin spiral, the order of one to two nanometer, this triple layer now has spin spirals, which are a little bit longer, like three to 10 nanometer and the quadruple layer, it doesn't have a spin spiral anymore. Um, it seems to be ferromagnetic with a very small anisotropy. So it can change direction, but it doesn't um, have a fixed period. Actually, if we look at such a sample, now not at low temperature, but at room temperature, we see that the magnetism is lost in the double layer. It's not magnetic anymore at room temperature, but the areas where we have three layers of iron or four layers of iron are still magnetic. That's what you see here. We also see that now the third and the fourth layer, they show the same magnetic period. At low temperature, we had three to 10 nanometer in the third and something close to ferromagnetic in the fourth layer. And now they have the same magnetic periodicity. Moreover, the periodicity of the third and fourth layer is much larger than what we saw at, at low temperature. The spin <coughs> spiral period is now about 10 times larger than at low temperature. Um, if we look at the temperature dependence of the magnetic period of the triple layer, it's these red dots here, you see this drastic increase, and this is the room temperature data, and um, you can also see that we can actually reproduce this in Monte Carlo simulations or mean field um, simulations, but this can only be done if we consider interactions between the layers. So mapping this system onto a single ma magnetic layer does not work. We would never get this increase of the magnetic period with temperature. And um, it was only possible to reproduce the experimental data when not only interlayer coupling, intralayer couplings, but also interlayer couplings um, were considered here. And then they have different st strength between the first and second and second and third layer. And with this, one could actually find this increase in the magnetic <coughs> period here, but only with these layer dependent magnetic interactions. Now, if we go back to low temperature and look at this um, third layer again, this is the topography where you see the reconstruction lines and this is the magnetic image, you see that in the third layer, many different um, period lengths actually exist. And um, if one analyzes this, one can see that really they range from very different 
um, length scales, but all of them show this very homogeneous sinusoidal shape. And this means that the magnetic anisotropy is very small, otherwise it would distort the spin spirals and they wouldn't show up um, as sine functions anymore. And if we now assume that the um, dn is basically dominated by the interface, we can draw some conclusions about what the strain does, but first let me show you how the spin spiral period actually behaves as a function of the dislocation line spacing. So in the topography you saw these dislocation lines very clearly. In the DIDV the, the magnetic signal dominates, but we can clearly correlate the magnetic wavelength with the strain relief due to the dislocation line incorporation. And we find this behavior here. And if, if we assume that the dm stays constant um, for the entire film because it's dominated by the interface, then we can actually attribute this, this change of the magnetic spin spiral period to a change in the ex exchange stiffness um, due to strain. So there's a very simple relation between the magnetic period and A over D. And now when D is constant because it's all the iron iridium interface, this change in magnetic period must be due to a change in the in the exchange stiffness and we see here that there's really a change in a factor 3 that we observe in this material. So basically the strain really plays a role um, for the magnetic length scale. And now I would like to focus on a region like this one here where we have again a zigzag spiral and um, the length scale is roughly 4 nanometer and this is what we measure without external magnetic field. And if we now apply an external magnetic field out of plane, we see that the spin spirals break up. And these are the smallest ma magnetic objects that we find, um, these bean-shaped <coughs> objects here. And of course, we would like to know the spin texture of these magnetic objects. And um, this basically shows us the out-of-plane component of the sample magnetization and to know what these magnetic objects really look like, we need to know something about the in-plane magnetization components. So this is an overview image and we use a tip that is magnetized in the sample surface plane and now we can measure skirmions on the different um, rotational domains here and we actually find that these magnetic objects here look different depending on from which tip magnetization perspective we look at them. It's always the projection. So these images, these um, magnetic objects are rotated by 120 degrees with respect to each other, but all imaged with the same tip. And now um, we can actually derive um, the spin texture of these magnetic objects. And this is what we propose that these bean-shaped objects look like. And as you can see, these are basically just distorted magnetic skirmions. And to convince you that this is actually something we can get from the data, we are doing spin polarized STM simulations of this spin texture. And this is the simulated images which um, compare nicely with the experimental data. And the reason that these skirmions are distorted is due to the strain relief of the iron film. So remember you have these um, dislocation lines. So one is here in the center and then here is more dislocation lines. And so the atoms don't have um, hexagonal symmetry anymore, but they are shifted and the skirmion distorts together with the atomic structure with the atomic structure of the iron film. So now, what can we do with these skirmions? Here are four in a row. And we now found that if we apply minus three volts locally on top of a skirmion, that it goes away. And also, we can do that to the other skirmions around. And they all go away when we park our tip on top of a skirmion and apply minus three volts. And um, now, if we invert the polarity of the bias voltage to plus 3 volt, we can all bring them back one after the other. That's very neat, but what is the mechanism to do this? How does this actually work? And in 
um, STM, you have a tip and you have your sample and you have a bias voltage and <coughs> then you generate an electric field which inverts the direction if you invert the bias voltage and you generate a tunnel current which changes its direction when you invert the bias voltage. So because we have this very strong directionality which is connected here to the sign of the bias polarity, there are two possible mechanisms for this um, very reproducible switching. It's either spin torque due to the spin polarized tunnel current or it's electric field driven. And we can actually um, switch the skirmions also with a non-magnetic tip and thus we can exclude the spin torque switching and in the next slide I would like to convince you that's really the electric field that is playing um, the key role here. So the electric field between tip and sample can be approximated just in a um, parallel plate model and we now ram the voltage and try to find out um, for various distances at which critical voltage the skirmion actually is written or deleted. So these are all single experiments sitting on top of a skirmion. We ramp the bias voltage and just um, put a dot here when we see that the skirmion is written or deleted. We do this for various tip sample distances and now um, we can actually extract a critical electric field just by a linear fit and we find that we need um, something close to 4 volts per nanometer for writing and deleting a <coughs> magnetic skirmion. If we um, change the external magnetic field that we are applying from 1.85 Tesla to 1.95 Tesla, we are um, favoring the ferromagnetic state. So the skirmion is more instable, which is why we need now more electric field to actually write the skirmion at this higher magnetic field. But of course, we also need less electric field to delete the magnetic skirmion because the ferromagnetic state is favored anyways. So we don't really know what the electric field is doing in detail, but we know it is the electric field that plays a key role. Basically, the electric field definitely changes the surface charge distribution. It may also change atom positions. And some of that will then, in the end, lead to a change in anisotropy, exchange constant, or even DMI. And it will modify the potential landscape to, in the end, favor or disfavor a magnetic skirmion. And thus, we are able to write or delete this magnetic skirmion. Um, and I think I still have a little bit of time to show more. First of all, this sort of sums this electric field up. It's very clear that with a magnetic field, we can tune the energy landscape. So if you think this is a skirmion, this is the ferromagnetic state here. Um, if you increase the um, external magnetic field, you favor the ferromagnetic state and you can drive it to the ferromagnetic phase. If you decrease the external magnetic field, you favor the skirmion state. And we can do this now locally um, with the electric field from our STM tip, where we actually also modify the potential landscape. And here, one volt per nanometer basically relates to approximately 40 millitesla in if converted to a magnetic field. And now I would like to briefly show you what happens if we use this double layer iron, which um, was reconstructed and had a magnetic period on the order of 1 or 1 1.5 nanometer, and we expose it to hydrogen gas, atomic hydrogen. There's different things that can be observed. First, we have less dislocation lines, so the hydrogen seems to um, act as a strain relief mechanism. So the, the iron gets pseudomorphic when it incorporates the hydrogen. And then we have two different hydrogen-induced superstructures. You see one large one here and one encircled one here. And I'm showing you zoom in, zoom in image of these two structures. So here you see a hexagonal superstructure 
Um, and this phase forms at room temperature, and the period is about two atomic distances here, whereas this phase here, it's also hydrogen induced, it forms at higher temperature, and it has um, a larger period of about one nanometer and is rotated with respect to this one. And both of these phases can be um, um, prepared very reproducibly. And now, of course, we're interested in the magnetic state. And this is a spin polarized image. Here you see this high temperature phase. And there's another island. You immediately see that they have two different colors. This is because the, their magnetization is opposite to each other. So they are ferromagnetic um, monodomain islands of this hydrogen phase here. And what you see around here is the other, the room temperature hydrogen phase. And here we observe this spin spiral with um, a magnetic length scale of about four nanometer. And if we apply a magnetic field to the system, we see that this ferromagnetic island switches. So now both of these are parallel to the external magnetic field. And we also see that this spin spiral breaks up into these dots here. So again, the question arises, what are these dots? And we look at such a sample with an in-plane magnetized tip. And we see that from this zero field spin spiral, we again go to this phase with all the dots in, the, in this room temperature hydrogen phase. And looking a little bit closer, you see that all these guys again have this two lobe structure and all of them have the same asymmetry so dark on the left and bright on the right so these are again magnetic skirmions with unique rotational sense and the DMI again um, is dominated probably by this iron iridium interface which was the basis for all our studies here and with this I would like to um, summarize I've shown to you that we can tune the magnetic state based on the iron iridium interface, which has this large DMI. And we can do this with additional metallic add layers like palladium, rhodium. And that if we um, do a detailed measurement of the size and shape of the magnetic field um, in a different magnetic field, we can derive um, the material parameters from our high resolution experiments. And um, I've shown to you that the higher iron layers on iridium sort of increasing with increasing thickness, they get a larger magnetic length scale. And then we have this um, unusual temperature dependence of the magnetic period, which increases by a factor of roughly 10 from um, liquid helium temperature to room temperature. We can tune the magnetic length scale also by the strain in the material. Um, and we can switch the magnetic skirmions with electric fields. And then also um, atomic hydrogen can actually tune the magnetic length scale. And um, I would like to acknowledge people <coughs> From the lab, Dr. Pinri Zhu did the um, electric field switching in the hydrogen. Aro also worked um, on the triple layer. Niklas mainly on the palladium iron. Andrei Kubetska is also a senior scientist. We're doing this together. And we all belong to the group of Professor Wiesendanger. And we got funding from the DFG and the European Union. Thank you for your attention. <coughs>